<laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us for Worldwide Slot Car Chat number 25. I'm your host, Greg Gow. Today we have Russ Paver, Mr. John Kitt, uh, Luff Linkert down over there. He's not in his chair at the moment. We've got Kelly Avery over there. And uh, Dennis Sampson is also here. Looks like we also have Chris Walker on the line. And not a whole lot of people right now, but I'm sure we'll get some more in because I just put links saying, hey, we're going live right now. So we'll probably have some people joining us. Uh, I did get a topic suggestion, but I'll hold off on that until uh, we, we get any random things out of the way. Russ and Dennis, do you guys have anything you want to talk about? Uh, You're muted, uh, Dennis. Yeah, Russ, Russ, I haven't had a chance to look at your cars yet, um, but I will. No problem. No. I've been I've been so busy this week. We had a we had our first one twenty four scale retro race last weekend, uh, the first big one uh, since coronavirus shut us down in in the beginning oh, yeah. of March, and so uh, there was a lot of preparation for that. Yeah, I've been seeing some some postings on Facebook of, of various racings going on, and yeah, it's starting up again. Nobody is a, wearing masks. Everybody wearing masks. Although what I do, I, I wear a mask, but then I also have one of those shields. Yeah, uh, it, it's quite a nice little uh, thing. It's basically you buy them flat, you fold them, and they have two little um, two little tabs at the top, and you actually slide it over the brim of a baseball cap. And so you put your baseball cap on, and it and it, the, the shields attached to that. And yeah, I printed it. Shields down the side, and it shields in the front, and then I can pull the mask off of my nose, and then my glasses don't fog up, and it works pretty well. Better than nothing. But what I was, I saw pictures of dudes that were racing side by side with no mask of any. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, Just come on. Not in California though. No. Yeah. Well, good for you guys having fun and, and yep. racing and being safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, did anybody else have any show and tell or questions they want to ask? Go ahead, John. Well, I actually uh, attempted a uh, Sidewinder chassis with an 030 motor, if anybody wants to see that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, here we go right here. And share. So there it is there. There's your chassis jig. Yeah, well, that's actually a porcelain filter thing. It works great as a jig. Awesome. Uh, let me just show you the... Uh, what's really interesting is that the, the, the gear mesh was really quite good, which I was, you know, I, again, I guess, you know, even a, even a blind squirrel can find a nut every so often. Uh, let me just find the, the pictures. Oh, um, that's, oh, that's what my daughter's been working on. Oh, there we go. There's the mesh there. It actually meshes quite well. And you got the motor soldered to a tube on the axle, basically. Well, actually, and then and then, oops, hang on, sorry. And then a pan. Uh, the the oops, uh, there we go. And then you, you solder it to that um, the pan right here. And I, I'm planning on having some sort of outrigger with um, uh, spring steel sort of uh, floating it on the what side. What with those? Oh, um, th this was actually something I found in in my my spares box, believe it or not. That white gear was something I had bought years ago from Professor Motor that didn't really mesh with anything. And then I realized that I had spurs to match and I forgot. <laughs> yeah, it looked like a 64 pitch um, commercial gear. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what it was, yeah. But what I'm really amazed at, so the, the interior dimension here is, uh, fits um, a 332nd axle and I just stacked two of them and it was parallel to the, uh, the gear of the motor and son of a gun, it meshed up really nicely. Awesome. Little and that's, sorry, I'll, I'll stop that. Sir. that. That's actually something my daughter's working on right now. So, so what are you putting that in, John? Well, you know what? Um, I was going to do a, a, it in one of the Lola T70s I've been, uh, I've been working on. Uh, but I think I'm going to scour. I've, I've got some lovely um, Porsche 356 bodies made by a company called Tomy. And it'll work really, really well. It almost like be like a li real little Porsche. So I think that's what I'm probably going to end up putting it in. John, with a, with a little motor like that, <clears throat> I mean, with any Sidewinder, um, if you're looking for a little less ground clearance or to lower the chassis, 
Um, in a sidewinder, there is absolutely no advantage whatsoever and there's no need to have the motor um, shaft parallel or in line with the rear axle. It can be anywhere around the 360 degrees. It doesn't make any difference. You'd have the motor further up so around that. that I can have the yeah, motor. I mean, you, just, you, you just basically think of the pinion as the sun and your spur as, as a point. I mean, it can go anywhere around that pinion that you want. Oh. So if you do, you know, those are, those are not very high motors. So any kind of a scale wheel is going to give you a ton of ground clearance on that. So if you want, you can move the rear axle up in relationship to the pinion. Um, and it makes zero, zero, absolutely. The gears have no idea where they are in relationship to each other. Oh, so that would lower the center of gravity and would handle that much better. <clears throat> well, yes. I mean, you're, you're just going to basically raise the rear axle, right, in relationship to the motor. The gears still mesh absolute they don't know where they are <laughs> they're just <laughs> okay cool no I'll, I'll try that that's a great thank you chris yeah and and don't I'll forget as you go up you have to you have to sort of come in a little bit so you're sort of making the spur go around a circle of the pinion right right you got to keep the keep the distance between the two the centers of the two shafts the same right Okay, cool. Thank you so much. That's, I'm going to try that next. Yeah, it's really fun to sort of tinker around with this stuff, like especially sidewinders, because I don't have a lot of experience with them. So I thought, give it a shot. Absolutely. All right. So your next project is going to be having the motor behind the rear axle like a real Porsche. Well, that actually, that was the, th that's the intent. In fact, if you rotate it around with this, this Tomy model, it has an opening rear hatch for where the engine is and the front. And I'm thinking very seriously about doing that and leaving everything hinged so that it's a real model race car. <laughs> that would be cool. I look forward to that. <laughs> Any, do you want to show off anything that uh, you, your daughter working on or? Oh, I, I, I can't actually, she just, it, it's funny. And I apologies to Luff. I, I know we're talking, we talked about TR4s, but she's still getting a lot of orders for her, um, her bug eyed sprites. And this is her latest, actually, let me go back here. Um, I'm just, sorry, uh, my, my apologies here. Um, here we go. And I've got a share screen. Where are you? There we go. Share screen. Um, she actually got a, this is kind of interesting because um, the, the gentleman who has ordered this car is uh, an author of a book all about uh, Austin Healy's. So uh, he asked specifically for Primrose, um, Austin Healy Bug Eyed Sprite, um, all street, uh, I guess, a uh, you know, windshield, left hand drive, AH hubcaps. And he, he sent a picture of his car with Donald Healy in it. So he asked for a figure of Mr. Healy. So that was the figure that Emma just, we just did a first pull. There she is with the, with the actual car. That's how far we are along now. The chassis is almost, it's almost uh, ready to go. And it, oh, that's me again, sorry folks. Oh, there we go. I, th that's a terrible picture because I took it, but she that was her sculpt of, of Donald Healy because the picture that we were given, he was in a suit. So she thought we'd do a suit, that's terrible. There, that's a little better. Um, you can kind of see that. Yeah, let me zoom in a little bit. Maybe that would help. Um, Should have done Jeff Healy. <laughs> actually, Jeff, Jeff Healy uh, and my wife actually knew each other because they went to public school together. Uh, and uh, so there you go, you can kind of see it. It's 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 tough in in sort of gray resin, but um, he's being painted as we uh, as we speak before I have to take her to her <laughs> her job. <laughs> so there you go. So yeah, no, and and it's oops, there we are. Okay, okay. So yeah, no, it's coming on quite nicely. And and I guess unlike Mark Tyler, Mark Tyler and his wife sculpt everything um, in about one. I think he said one twelfth scale, and then they actually scan it down. Um, digitize it, and then they do all the different scales for uh, uh, 3D printing. Uh, Emma just goes and does it in one thirty-second scale because we just go straight to uh, making a mold and then cleaning up that first mold and then making a proper, or uh, first casting and then making a proper mold. So cool! I will stop cool. sharing. Thanks for uh, thanks for looking. Anything else? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've got one topic to bring up. 
and it'll probably spur some conversation, but figure we might as well let everybody talk and show off and ask questions and stuff. Does anybody else have any show and tell or any questions they want to bring up? Hearing none, I'll go ahead and whip out the topic. Uh, so, so this will, this is pretty, pretty general. So he asked, where do you start when tuning a car and what kind of track? So I was thinking we could just kind of go around and talk about the general kind of racing that we do, what kind of car, what kind of track, and what what is your sequence of events for uh, you know building a car or tuning a ready to run car or whatever. Does anybody want to start? Sent in the question. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> So I race primarily 132nd scale, primarily ready to run cars, primarily on sport track, though I do run those same cars on uh, routed wooden tracks. Um, you know, it's usually something like a Skelectric or a Ninco or a NSR or a slotted or, you know, racer or whatever. So ready to run. And I'm not a stickler about calling them ready to run because they are ready to run just not necessarily the best running. Uh, so when I take a car out of the box, mo most of my running is without magnets. So if I intend to, to actually drive the car, I, I'll make sure it works. You know, I'll put a battery to the braids and then I'll open up the car and take the magnet out. Uh, if I'm just driving it around, I might sand the tires and then play with it. If it's going to be raced competitively in, a, in one of my clubs, then I generally start with whatever tires are needed for that race. So it's you know, going to be urethane tires or NSR tires or slotted N22s or whatever tires are required for that uh, series. Uh, so I'll get those tires and then I'll put them on the back, see how it goes. Most of the time I'll glue them on because most of the time I need to true the tires. So the next step is going to be popping the axle out, putting it on my tire razor uh, and chewing them down. Uh, once I'm happy with the roundness of the rear tires, I'll stick it in the car and give it a drive around. Usually the front tires need some work too. So then step number two is getting the front out on Skelectric. It's a pain in the butt because they're press on. You can't pop the whole axle out like you can on the rear. So you gotta work one wheel off and then Put them back together to get them both on the tire razor. Usually, I'm, I'm getting pretty good at that. You just got to go slow, uh, and then when you're done with them, you got to glue them back together. But put that on the tire razor, get it all nice and round, and then put a. If we're allowed to put a coating on, I'll put a, uh, uh, you know, clear nail polish or super glue coating on the front tire to reduce grip. Or if we're allowed to have zero grip tires, we'll put zero grips on. But zero grips have grip, so I prefer. Uh, Super glue is my favorite coating because nail polish doesn't seem to be as sandable and smooth as super glue is. Uh, once I'm happy with the front tires, I stick it back in the car. Uh, sometimes I'll put it on a setup block. If there's if there's any way for me to adjust the you know the axle holders, I'll put it, the car on a setup block and tweak the tweak the set screws or grub screws to raise or lower whichever part so that the car is nice and on all four wheels. And then I'll run it around some more. And if I'm having problems in turns or whatever the case may be, then I'll look to putting some weight in or you know, figuring out what that problem is and fixing it. Um, generally, I don't go much beyond that. I, 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 only, I only ever put weight in anywhere when the car likes to understeer. It, it just, no matter what I do, it, it just wants to teeter out and come out of the slot or something, at which point I'll, I'll put some weight up front. We usually don't allow more than 10 grams. Usually it's somewhere between five and 10 grams allowable weight. So that whole, that whole lump goes up front somewhere to help keep the guide down. Uh, most of the time, that's pretty much all I ever do. You know, I, I used to do things like gluing in the motor or gluing in the uh, bushings and, you know, changing braids and, you know, changing guides and stuff like that. But nine times out of 10, those aren't what's getting me kicked out of the slot. Usually it's my trigger finger is getting me out of the slot. 
So if the car is running smooth and, and consistent, then that's pretty much all I need to do is make sure all the wheels are round, proper grip or lack of grip, uh, and then a little bit of weight. So that's my kind of racing. I know there's a big variety of types of racing out there or just playing around with your cars. Who would like to go next? All right, Russ, go for it. I, I pretty much handle mine the same way as you do yours with the exception when I'm putting weight in it, it's usually in the front end and I put the car on four small scales to decide where I need to put that weight. You know, because the gram scales for each tire are never the same. <clears throat> They're just a little bit different. So I'll put the weight as close as I can to making the car perfectly level. Unless we're on a roundy round track. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're going through. Oh, okay. so, if you're, so if you're doing NASCAR, yeah, that, I mean, that's really the only thing I do because, like you, the problem if I was a perfect driver, then I'd be going deep for looking for things, you know, and, and, um, but, you know, it's same thing. My finger gets me into trouble. If you're doing roundy round racing, what kind of things would you do differently? Um, I would sand more on the, um, when I'm putting my wheels and tires, I put them on the hoodie. So if we're running uh, a circular track, then I'll do a set of tires so that my outside tires are a little bit larger than the inside tires, just on the rear. So it's kind of a little bit of weight jacking like that, but um, we don't have that many circular tracks. If we did and we ran a series, then it'd definitely be something to do. So I usually have two pairs of tires, one for that if we're running it, and one for our typical run, so. All right, cool, thanks for uh, contributing. Who would like to go next, if anybody? <laughs> I got a couple of, couple of comments on what you were saying. Sure. Uh, the front axles on uh, scale extra cars, where you, it's so, so difficult to take the tire out, <coughs> to, take, to take the axle out, because those, those things are pretty tight on there. Um, there's a couple of tricks. Uh, one of them is I turn my tire razor around and turn the, and basically take the car and put the front wheel directly onto the drum that's on the motor of the tire razor and let it spin it up and then just use a, use a file or a, an emery board and just take the corners off the tire. Let the, let the drum of the motor uh, that normally has the O-ring pulley around it just let that spin the spin the wheel up, and then just take the edges off. It actually works pretty well. Yeah, um, just leave it on the leave it in the yep. car, and just hold yep. the car on that to make that, it go around. That's one way. Then the other way is this. Uh, it's just a little, it's a, a little piece of axle with two bushings on it, and on the end of it, I've put a uh, machined aluminum. Uh, it looks like a wheel, right? It's the same profile as the scale electric front wheel. And then you put your uh, you put your tire razor driver, uh, that little drive pulley in the middle. You put this in the in there. You take the, the rubber off the off the car, put the rubber on here, true it up, and do them individually like that. The problem I have with doing that kind of stuff is is the wheels are almost never perfectly round, so you gotta. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I usually basically treat the wheel and the tire as one single thing and, mm -hmm. and let the tire compensate, let the truing of the tire compensate for the out of yeah. roundness or off. off oh, yeah. you, take of the first, you take the first rubber off and you spin everything up using the other rubber tire on the back of your, <clears> your tire razor and then uh, tip them around that way. 
But yeah. anyway, yeah, there are a couple of ways of doing it. Yeah, no, that's good. But one of the things that we did a long time ago, uh, one of the guys in the club had a um, um, stationary belt sander. And so he basically did it as a rolling road and you pop the guide out and hold your car on it and do it at an angle so that it's making the wheels turn as well as sanding them. <laughs> but I don't have a stationary belt sander to do that with, so I don't, I can't do that. I have, I've never even thought of trying that. <laughs> you, never even thought of it. Well, you, you're running it. It's right there. But you, when you do that, oh, yeah, something I, I, you don't even aren't you doing it at a slip <laughs> angle? <laughs> Too many people. John, you go. I was gonna say, aren't, aren't you sort of running it in the car at a slip angle, though? I mean, when you do that? Yeah, but you got if you just have it straight on, then the, the wheels are just going to roll. Sure. They're not going to get sanded. So you got to have a little bit of an angle so that it's actually taking some material off. What were you going to say, Chris? Sorry, Chris. I was just saying to Dennis, leave your belt sander where it is. Don't even think about it. <laughs> I didn't run out to Harbor Freight and get a belt sander. Mm -hmm. I, I still prefer getting those things off of there and you know, sticking uh, them on. I, I have maybe four different... Uh, four different makes of tire truers. I'm not about to start using a belt sander for that job. Yeah. Well, since you're already talking, what do you do when you're getting a car set Me? up for racing? Yes. I do. Well, it depends. First of all, it depends on the rules, right? Yeah. And so sometimes the rules don't allow you to do very much. Sometimes they do. But when I get in, let's just go through it. When I buy a new car, the very, very first thing I ever do, take it out the box and just check that everything's free and I'll put it on the track and run it out of the box just to see what it's like. Uh, not that I ever will leave it like that, but uh, um, I just like to get a feel for it. Sometimes you, you, the cars feel really good when they come out of the box, sometimes they don't. Um, my tracks would. Uh, I tend to buy uh, high-end cars, uh, NSR, Scale Auto, Slot It, uh, Sideways, um, Revo Slot, uh, those kind of things, right? Generally, every car I buy, uh, which is all the high-end stuff, uh, I'll put it on the track and run it, just to feel it, and then, uh, then I'll start. Um, and sometimes I know before I start, because, you know, if you've bought one slotted Group C, you've bought plenty, and you know how to you know how to tune them for a specific track. If it's a brand new car from a different manufacturer, I might do something different. Uh, but what I've often done with um, friends who buy a car is I'll step them through a process. I'll get them to drive their car on the track with just as it comes out the box. Then the very first thing I'll do is get them to loosen off the pod screws and the and the um, and the uh, body screws a quarter turn or a half turn, put it back on the track, feel what it feels like. Then we'll true the tires, put it back on the track, see what it feels like. Um, and all of those things, just to give people an idea of how the, the, the handling changes and the drivability progresses as you start going through all these various little bits of, um, you know, all these little tuning tricks. Uh, pretty much all of the cars that we run on my track now are running on rubber. Uh, we run either on NSR or uh, Ultra Grips or Super Grips or on uh, slotted um, N22s or F22s, uh, mostly N22s uh, in the two different sizes that are available. So that's the first thing we do. We change out the tires. Uh, on my cars, of course, the very first thing I do before I glue the tires on is to put a foam insert inside them, um, either using the NSR insert wheels the air wheels or by machining a groove in the slotted wheels and putting a little foam insert that I've talked about before. Um, and then I'll, from there, I'll start tuning. But very often, I'll, the first thing that I'll do once the, once the tires are done, put it on a board, check that everything's straight, that everything's level, that the front end is running right. I have a setup board that has a, a, a slot where the guide fits with a 10,000th um, recessed there which is what my tracks braid is recessed and i'll now check that everything is that everything is set correctly that the front wheels are riding at the right height that the guide is as far down into the slot as it'll go good pressure on the braid uh, and then start feeling the car a little bit to see whether there's any um any uh bias from one side to the other 
check whether the check whether the, the chassis is straight. A lot of times the chassis are not straight. So if if it's really bad, uh, then I'll strip the whole car down, take the chassis. I have a, a, a nickel plated piece of steel uh, that I will hold the chassis down with um, magnets and put it in a Pyrex dish and cover it in boiling water and leave it for a couple of hours so that it flattens. Then reassemble everything and check it all out. Um, and uh, then it's just a matter of get it on the track and try it. Um, sometimes cars like a lot of movement on the pods. If it's a potted chassis, sometimes they don't. They like just a little bit of movement. Most of the slotted cars, in my experience now, just like a little bit of movement. It's not. It's not. They're not very loose. They just the pod can just slide and shake a little bit in the car. And then the body can rattle a little on the, on there. Uh, I'll try that. I'll try a little bit of weight, depending on what's happening with the car. If the car's coming out, nose out, as Greg was talking about, uh, understeering. Uh, if it's coming out early in the turn, as as you go into the turn and apply the power, the front drifts out. Then I'll start putting weight at the rear of the car. Uh, if it's the other way around and at the end of the turn, the the rear end's going away, then I'll start putting weight in the front of the car. Um, and uh, sometimes I'll try putting the weight on the pod rather than on the chassis. Uh, I always like to have a little bit of a couple of those um, uh, slotted uh, tungsten magnets or those little tungsten weights that they have that look like they're, they're magnets because that's very nice to be able to pop those into the magnet hole, the magnet holders in the pod. And sometimes that works better than putting it on the chassis. Uh, it just depends again on the car. And then the last thing that I'll do very often is I'll try taping up the pod. You have a little bit of movement between the chassis and the pod, but then I'll cover the underneath of the car uh, between the chassis and the motor pod itself with uh, some type of tape. So I'll tape from the front to the rear, uh, either with uh, black insulation tape, plastic insulation tape, or with a fiber tape, or sometimes a medical tape. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll try different ones because the different the different tapes give different uh, effects. Did Chris want to say something? Yes. Sound like he was just clearing his throat. Did you have anything to add to that, Chris? And uh, you, what you'll find if uh, as you go through it, if you if you've got your lap counters on and you're looking at your lap times, um, that eventually you you know you're getting better and better lap times. I mean, I took a Mazetti, uh, the MR slot car. Um, his new uh, Porsche 911 uh, GT1 Evo, the 1997 GT1 Evo that's just come out. Took one of those, and on my track, out of the box, it ran uh, like 7.3, 7.4 second laps. By the time I was finished with it, it was running 5.7 second laps. And that's all in the tires and weight and tape. But I guess the biggest thing, biggest, 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 biggest thing always is tires. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't do anything else, then you tires, do. tires, tires. Yeah. yeah. I forgot about the the chassis flattening thing. I haven't really been checking my chassis lately. I, if I have a dud of a car, I should probably do that. <laughs> yeah. Some of them, some of them are really bad. Some of them are really good. And, oh, and they they vary from one from one manufacturer to the next, from one model to the next, and sometimes even uh, it'll be you know, early in a batch or late in a batch of, of injection moldings of the same chassis, they're not going to necessarily be straight. Yeah. Yeah. And just a little bit, you know, is, is something that you can, by, by correcting a slightly yeah. unflat chassis, you don't have to do some of the other things. Yeah. Like For example, I, I, I had a, I had a slotted uh, McLaren M8, uh, really, really, really lovely little car. The chassis was really nice and straight except the little piece where the guide is and the guide was nosing down at the front and, and nose down guide is not a good thing for handling right the car got it two tenths better as soon as it got that flat same thing happened with that poly car um new ferrari formula one <coughs> the front end of that um of that motor pod is also uh on the one i had was also uh, uh pointed down and the whole car uh, had this excess ground clearance in the middle of the car, right? It looked like a like a bridge over some 
canal in Venice or something. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for sharing your uh, your, your process. That's all. I'm not going to give you. Uh, well, I don't I mean, there's, there's you guys, more. So, there's there's always matter. more. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's always more. But that, that's the, those are the main things. Does anybody else want to kind of go over their their tricks of the trade? Uh, I got, uh, I've got a question. Go ahead, Dennis. What is the purpose of the strapping tape on the bottom on the chassis? <coughs> what it excuse me what it does is it dampens the movement so you have <coughs> excuse me you have the looseness between the chassis and the pod and that allows the car to settle nicely and make sure that the front and rear tires are always touching well but sometimes in the turns that allows the back end to bounce a little bit if you put the tape on what, it, what you find is that it dampens that movement. It's, you still have the movement there, but it's like putting a shock absorber in instead of just having springs. Right. And yeah. uh, it does calm the, the car down. Sometimes it will make the car a lot faster, but, but less easy to drive. And that's when I start playing with the type of tape. Because for instance, if I use, the, if I use a fiber tape, uh, on a 132nd scale car, it's usually too stiff. That's why I will go from the fiber tape maybe to uh, to a black insulation tape, the plastic insulation tape, or even down to that, that medical tape, that stuff that tears with the little holes in it. That actually works really, really well as a, as a, as a way of taping these cars. Sorry, and, D Dennis, do you put on both sides of the of the of the? Oh, chassis? let me let me grab one and I'll show you. Hold on a moment. I mean, how you tape it is going to depend on what kind of dampening you want to do. Uh, sometimes just a single piece that goes from one side of the chassis across the pod to the other side of the chassis is all you need. And then sometimes I've seen cars where the entire chassis is just solid tape. <laughs> Probably because they want to cover up the screw holes as well, so the screws don't fall out and, and land in the oh. track or something like that. But, yeah. but I'm sure Dennis. So, so here's this is a this is a a uh, Mazzetti McLaren F1 F1 GTR uh, mm -hmm. with no tape on the bottom, right? So just so that you can see the shape of the the shape of the pod. Right. All right. And then this is the new one that has the new car. And what I did, uh, let me see if I can find a way to point here. There are two layers of two oh. strips of tape all the way down the chassis. So they cover those edges between the pod and the chassis all the way to the back of the chassis. So right along these little bits here, right along the, those edges there, right? Where, mm -hmm. the, where the chassis protrudes, all of that that, inter, that that joint or that area between the two is covered over completely. So the, pods, the pod still moves. I don't know if you could see that. The pods, you could see there, you could see the, you could see the tape yeah. flexing, right? Yes. So the pod still has its, the same movement, right? But <clears throat> the tape dampens that movement. And so you don't get this chatter as a car comes out the turn or goes through a turn. So, uh, Dennis, why do, you, why do you put the tape, uh, I guess, uh, parallel to the edge of the car rather than perpendicular? Is there a difference? Uh, no, it's just the particular way that I like to do it. What, what you could also do it would be to, on a triangular pod, would be to have two strips at angles. Right. So, because basically what you're wanting to do is you want it to cover that area between the uh, where the joint or where the gap is between the chassis and the pod. So actually on these, it might even be better to do it at an angle like that and get a little bit more coverage. Uh, you know, I've seen guys tape them this way and that away. Right. Wow. If you have, if you have a look on home racing world and some of the proxy series and you look at the guys that, um, that send in cars, particularly the guys from Connecticut and uh, uh, the, the East Coast, uh, those things are covered in strapping tape underneath. Yeah. Um, it's, a major, it's a major tuning aid that many, many people use. 
Yeah. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll have to send you a roll of hockey tape to try and see if it makes a difference. Yeah. Anything, you know, as I say, particularly in the 124 scale cars uh, that, I, that I run, I use a variety of tapes there. Fiber tape, strapping tape, fiber strapping tape, uh, medical tape, insulation tape. Um, I've used a gel tape before that's actually quite thick. Then you put it on the top of the chassis because you can't put it underneath because it's too thick. Um, uh, lately, I've been trying some Kapton tape that I have. Uh, and every one of them, you can feel slight differences. And on the 124 scale cars, I'll vary the width of the tape because usually that will go uh, 90 degrees across the car because you're trying to control these two pans on the outside. And um, so they go across the car and then I will change the, the width of the tape as well as the type of the tape. Yeah. If you, um, the whole movement thing in the pod, <clears throat> if, if you're running on a plastic track, you can afford to run the pod with a little bit of free movement. Quite frankly, your car 50% of the time is not on the track, it's bouncing around in the air. So it, it, it doesn't, it's not as critical, but like, a one-to-one -one car, free movement in a suspension or any car is a complete and utter no-no. It's like you've seen guys driving down the highway and they're real cars with no shocks and the tires are bouncing all over the place. So if you can't control the positioning and the movement of the rear tires in relationship to the track, you're leaving a lot of performance out there. So what the movement is great to a degree, um, and it, it's all relative to the track, the track surface, the tires, the amount of grip, blah, 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 blah. A lot of things go into deciding how much movement. But if, if the rear, if there is some torsional flex in the chassis, it allows the outside rear tire to compress and load progressively in a corner, which will enhance grip. So a few years ago, you saw all the guys in proxies and stuff and the, and the pods, you could flap them around a quarter of an inch. They were just all over the place. Guys started to slowly figure out that if you can control the rear wheels, if you can keep them on the track, it's gonna help. Because if, if the pod is uncontrolled, one time you go around the corner and the pod bounces one way. And then the next time you go around the, the corner, the pod bounces, who knows? It's not consistent. So from a driver's perspective, you've got a car that you go, Jesus, it didn't do that a lot. Like what, how can I get some consistency in the whole thing? So as Dennis rightly said, tape is, is like putting a mild shock absorber on your car, which controls the movement. Now, I don't use tape um, for a variety of reasons. I use some thin silicone or urethane washers. And I stack those between the bottom of the chassis pod lugs and the top of the chassis plate. I may have to cut some of uh, the depth underneath the pod lugs. So I'm not changing the overall ride height when I put these, wa these washers are only got 20, 25 thou thick. So they don't make much of a difference. What the reason I like those is that the urethane and or the silicone is much more consistent. So if I'm entering a proxy and I use electrical tape or fiber. If I was in a, a single race, I have fewer objections to using tape. Um, but in a proxy race over a 10 race series, that tape will fatigue. So the handling characteristics when I tested on my track today will change by the time it gets to Greg's host proxy round nine races down the road. I also happen to think that the pod lugs used with some nice machine screws and nylock nuts just looks a whole bunch cooler than tape on the bottom of the car. And I never run the risk of peeling an edge of tape off of the bottom of my chassis and interrupting with the car as it goes along. So exactly the same 
reason um, that I want to control the, the pod and, and the movement in the, 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 the torsional flex in the car, but just to, my impression is it's just a little more elegant way of going about the whole thing. But So, um, so Chris, when, when you put your, your urethane washers in, do you have different shore uh, values to sort of play no, with? The they're, no, they're, they're pretty soft. Um, I got Art to make a whole bunch of the urethane uh, washers. Since then, uh, Ernie has uh, produced a bunch of silicone washers. And, and he has them in different thicknesses too, as Ernie. Yeah, different thicknesses. And I was talking to him today and he's found a new supplier to make a little, a few softer ones. So did you, I sent you some of those, did I not? Or did he? I have some of his, yeah. Okay. Um, Where's so, the best <laughs> Depending on what I want to do, John, is I may use one, I may use two, and I'll all so, and I'll also use them above the motor pod, where I put the nylock. Because don't forget, it has to be able that way. I'm isolating the pod above and below with silicone and or urethane washers, so I get a very consistent and progressive rotation in the pod. Yeah, and the, the other real advantage, especially of urethane, is that, you know, on the rebound, I mean, it's, it's like a shock absorber, very much like one. Well, I mean, not that much different than tape, because don't forget, you're taping both sides of the pod. Oh. So one, you know, if, if you think of the pod, one, as it, as it tilts left to right, and then right to left, the two sides of the tape tend to, to counteract each other and offer some resistance on yeah, yeah. If you've ever driven any of Chris's cars, you will know that they are the smoothest, nicest, best driving slot cars you've ever come across in your life. Those things are they are absolutely amazing. It's not only the the, the, the silicon or the urethane dampers, but uh, it's a lot that has a lot to do with it. And with that, I think we should all go home now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the check's in the mail, right? Yes. <laughs> well, where do you... I, I've driven some of his cars here at, at um, pro, on pro, for proxy races, and they always are incredible. They really are. They, he sent a, um, a, 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 a mildly tuned slotted uh, McLaren M8 D in one of the Can-Ams, that, that lovely uh, fluorescent red number 60 that he did. Yeah. Uh, absolute sweetheart of a car i can't tell you how nice that thing was to drive i might have driven one have you ever entered the slot it uh the international slot it group c product? Uh, i have not um, Me neither. i have not well where does one get these excellent uh little rubber or silicone washers uh you can i will you could probably will... check with alan with that um that 132 slot car because um, oh, I stuff. think I think that he and Ernie have been collaborating on some of these things. Yeah, I'm not uh, sure whether Ernie whether Alan has got these, but certainly I, Ernie has. I think he does. Um, if if you can't find them, Greg or anyone here, let me know. Um, I am probably closer to Ernie than far, further away. I, I, I see him pretty, I have a pretty good in with him. Um, I do some work with him on some of the testing and some of the stuff that. So if you want them, um, the other thing you should buy in conjunction with these is if you're just using a, a typical slot it, uh, screw, you sort of defeat the purpose. You really want to go from slot car corner and get some of the um, uh, threaded partway bolts, if you know what I mean, like they've got a smooth shank with a nylock nut. Yeah, we call them tuner screws. Yeah, perfect. Um, you know, you set your adjustment, you set your pod, and you don't have to worry about the, the thing changing on you or working loose. It's, it's pretty good. Um, and these will make they will make less of a difference on your track, Greg, because it's plastic and the, car, the, the cars are susceptible to the, it will make a difference, 
but it's not going to make the difference that you would traditionally see on a smooth wood track. Sure. Okay. Cool. Um, so if you can't get some, let me know um, and I'll get you some. And anyone here, if you want to try them, it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, I'm sure John doesn't have them. I'm sure he can get them. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention on chassis flattening, um, it's, a, it's a very good idea to a point. Um, if you have an adjustable ride height front axle, um, you can easily compensate for any tiny little uh, uh, chassis twists um, by setting the front axle a little bit differently from left or right. The chassis won't know. Um, that won't drive any more differently than a flattened chassis. I mean, obviously you want all four wheels to do what they need to do. Right, well, I, I sort of take things a little bit further than that. I don't assume that just because I flatten a plastic chassis at the end of the day, it's gonna be perfectly flat. And then as soon as I put the pod in, um, the pod being much stronger, blah, 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 and you're putting in with screws, the pod will distort the chassis plate or can distort the chassis plate. So typically what I do, if the chassis is really bad and it doesn't, my big concern is it doesn't fit in the cavity of the body nice and square. Um, so once it's done that reasonably well, I'll put the pod in and set the pod with my little washers or with Dennis's tape, with, you know, the tape method. The last thing I do is put it on a flat block and put my front axle in, <clears throat> set the rear axle, and then to see if there's any twist in the chassis, I'll put my finger on the front of the chassis on the sides, the corners of the front, in front of the front wheels, and just push down a little bit. And if I push down on the left side a little bit and the right rear wheel lifts off the track, I know that I don't have a really stable chassis. And then I'll do the right or the left, the other side and, and, and see what happens. So, you know, a couple of thou difference on how the um, chassis reacts can make a big difference. As Dennis said, um, you know, sometimes you can put your finger in the rear wheel and one wheel will lift up a lot easier than the other one. You know, so that's, that's gonna lead to a regular handling going through left and or right corner. So, there's a, there's a, you know, from taking the car out of the box and putting it on the track to, to getting it to where it, to as good as it can be is, is pretty involved. Um, you can make a massive difference to these cars. As Dennis said, you know, he took the, the car out and was doing seven second laps and then with tuning five second laps, that's, that's, that's nothing. That's like that. I mean, not to not to say he's not. That's fairly common. I mean, you can make these things from. I do not. I don't think I have ever taken a car out of the box and put it on the track. Um, I take. That's just me. That's just. I'm not saying that's that's. I take the car apart totally. Axles out, pod out, washers out, motor out, everything. I got a pile of pieces. And then as I, I, I went through, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I start with the guy. Every slotted car has a little dimple on the other underside of the guy. That's got to be shaved off and it's got to be cleaned and it's got to, and then I go through the whole thing, put it together with zero weight, praying that it'll be fine because a light car is generally quicker and better than a heavy car, put it on the track, and then the car will tell me what it wants and, and what it needs. Um, so Russell, when you said you sort of corner weight the cars, uh, that's not a bad thing, but <clears throat> depending on the car. So if, if you take a slotted Alpha T33, which is like an inch and a half long, and compare that to a, a bloody great big long thing, um, the dynamics at work and the physics at work will suggest that no, 
the weight balance on both of those cars can be different because you've got a longer guide lead and the pendulum effect and everything like that. So put the car on the track, no weight. Again, true and, and as, as Dennis said, tire, true tires, four round tires are the biggest single secret in the type of slot car racing we do. All the rest of the stuff is, you know, we can go on about how many spacers you should use per side and clearances and all those things make a difference. But the number one thing is four round tires. All the rest is incremental stuff. Um, now I forgot where I was and what I was talking about. I'm getting so happy rambling to myself. So, so Chris, it's not, it's not only round uh, tires, but also round wheels, right? Well, you, you, round wheel, well, if 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 you take if you put a tire on a slightly not round wheel and true the whole thing as a unit, you will have a round unit. So, what I will normally do on some wheels, especially plastic wheels, if I'm using them, I'll just make sure quickly that there's no flash ridge or little mold bumps on the wheel that will stop me from making a good glue bond with the tire on the wheel. I do not true wheels, plastic, metal, anything. Um, put the tires on, glue them, and, and true the whole bloody thing as a unit, and they will be round. Yeah, you can, you can fix a pretty bad wheel with, with that method. I, I had a fly that was just a atrocious i mean you could just turn it by hand and and see it go and then you, you know you put some actual power to it and it's like that i put a urethane tire on there the tire ended up pretty thin but it was round well yeah i mean sure you've got a tire that looks you know, you know one side of it's a 16th of an inch thick and the other side's an eighth of an inch thick but the, the whole unit's round yeah that's just I see Graham has Graham has a has a, a friend with him today. <laughs> He's a kind of bored friend, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to put tape on his bottom, and I want to get all four paws touching the ground at the same time. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I can see that the braid's a little out of control, but other than that, I think yeah. you got a good one there. No he, he, he's a little off balance sometimes, honestly. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Chris, I'm with you there. Uh, you know, you could you 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 can get a round assembly. The problem is, of course, that the you know the the rubber and the and the plastic of the wheel are not the same weight, so yeah. you may not actually get a balanced assembly. It yeah. may be round, but it's yeah. not necessarily going to be balanced if there's a big discrepancy between the concentricity of the wheel and the concentricity of the of the tire when you're done. No, I, I agree with you 100%, but, but for, from a racing, from a, again, depending on the rules, yeah. if it's a race. And from a, yeah, and from a 130 seconds kind of slot car point of view, it's not much. No. But, you know, if you're running, Euro, if you're running one to 24 scale Eurosports or things like that at, at world level, those guys balance their wheels, each yeah. individual wheel. Yeah. All right. How do you? How do they do that? Like they have a little balancing, like they have a, little... a little balancer, yeah. yeah. Like a like a like a, um, a, a radio control airplane prop balancer, where you put the propeller on a yeah. on a on a, a rod, and usually they hang it between two magnets. They'll do the same. They'll do the same with their tires and hang them. Hang the put the tire on the axle. Put the axle in between the two magnets. Let it roll till they find the heavy spot. Then they will start putting little bits of tape on the inside of the rim on the opposite side until it's balanced. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> speed costs, it costs money and it costs time. How much time do you want to spend? How much money do you want to spend? That's right. one of those things when you're running at a world championship level, maybe that's what you want to do. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't want to do that, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you, you have to realize, John, I mean, as soon as you drill a hole in a wheel and put a set screw in, the set screw doesn't weigh as much as the material you took out of the wheel. So you're throwing everything out of balance. And, you know, with the bloody speed of the Eurosports and the wing cars with, you know, a couple of hundred thousand RPM motors, like you can, 
You got to be real careful. Yeah, they're, 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 they're like flying Dremel tools. <laughs> well, they're, yeah, they're, they're fast. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. But this whole, the whole deal of setting up cars and is, it, you know, it's one of the fun parts of our, of our hobby for me anyway. Um, it's also a way of uh, making a little bit of money by selling people kinds of tools and jigs and fixtures that they really, really need. Uh, I, I made up a, um, I made up a, uh, a little tool a, little, a while back. Um, if you've ever run 130, uh, 112 scale or 110 scale uh, radio control cars, uh, in the early days when those things didn't have any suspension, when they were what were called pan cars, uh, you used to have uh, the problem that we were talking about, which they called tweak, where the, the, the chassis plate of the car, which in those days was uh, usually glass fiber sheeting of some sort, um, it, it, had a, it had a twist in it. And so you, you would get a car where it would sit on its wheels, but the, fr the, 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 the wheels would not have equal pressure left to right or front to rear or whatever. And uh, then the car would the, the car would handle differently in uh, left and right turns. So they developed these little things called tweak boards. And uh, a little while back, I made one, uh, and I started selling them for um, for uh, slot cars. And uh, oh, screen sharing is disabled. Okay, you'd have to enable my screen share, please. Great. Yep, yep, working on it. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't want to do it for everybody. Stop video chat, remain pin, spotlight, my host, and you can allow to record. Okay, well, I guess we'll have to do it for everybody. All right, should be able to go now. Well, okay, we're we I just want to say thanks to Chris and Dennis for this information. It's very cool. Okay, well, I'm good. Glad. I hope it helps everybody. Okay, so this was a tweak board that I made. Um, it's basically two strips of aluminum uh, or aluminium for you guys up north uh, or in the UK. Uh, it, there's a there's a stainless steel rod, a couple of a couple of uh, collars and set screws and things like that, and a little bubble level. And what you do is you you put this whole thing together like that, right? This is showing it upside down right now. And you set it so that you have the distance between one of these beams and the other beam at about the wheelbase of the car. Okay. And you turn it over the other way and you stand it on three, um, on these three legs, uh, the two set screws in one side, which is where the, which is where the central rod is fixed and one set screw underneath this um, little uh, set screw that, that positions the, the moving part of the of the of the uh, tweet board, then you put it down and you put your bubble level on and you set it all up. Then you put the chassis onto the onto the board, right? And you set it nice and central with the front wheels. In this case, the front wheels on the stationary edge, and the rear wheels are on the piece of the, uh, of the on the beam that pivots. Then you place your little bubble level. Uh, just behind the wheel on those two pins and immediately you can tell if the chassis is is straight and balanced and the wheels are all the same size and there's no twist in it then the bubble level will be in the middle uh, if the bubble level is not in the middle like this then you know that the, that the car has an inherent tweak in it and you need to twist it to bend it or resolder or readjust or whatever in order to get it and so that it sits right in the middle like that okay and you could feel the difference when you put the car on the track that uh, it takes right hand turns and left hand turns the same now whereas before you might have had a problem coming out on left turns and staying in on right turns uh, this is something particularly with brass and wire chassis it's something that happens a lot but i use i use my one on um on uh, one thirty second scale cars too 
So that can even happen as careful as you are building it on a flat oh, yeah. surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, you know, as you as you're soldering everything together, everything's hot. Uh, particularly if you're doing like I do on many cars, where I use a combination of brass and steel rails, and they're soldered together for various lengths of the rail from front to rear. Uh, the differential expansion of the brass and steel can in can put some kind of a little tweak into the chassis, or uh, maybe the the steel wasn't quite straight or something like that yeah it happens a lot so, uh, or you know you, you you built the car it's nice and flat it worked great the first time uh then somebody came off in front of you and you hit the guy and for the next three heats the car won't handle them you put it back on the board you find out yeah they, they tweak the chassis and the one wheel is is maybe only half a millimeter in the air but it's enough to change the whole balance of the car Yeah. Everybody, everybody wants stock, to stock our corner may still have some of those uh, some of those tweak boards. I, I was going to say everybody wants to know how much these are, Dennis. <laughs> uh, there, but it, I, I sell them for fifty dollars, but uh, I think stock our corner may still have some because I I know that I've spent, sold them quite a few over the years. Now, now, do you have you used them for one thirty second scale cars as well, Dennis? Oh yeah, 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 because it's adjustable. You can adjust it. You can adjust it up and down. Uh, for that, um, and it's quite easy. Sometimes with the one thirty second scale car, where the uh, where the um, guide is not very far forward of the wheels, uh, you may have to actually take the guide out so that you can get all four wheels uh, sitting on the on the jig. But uh, with a one twenty four scale car, where the, the pivot of the guide is like an inch ahead of the front wheels they they fit quite easily sometimes on a like on, a, on an nsr or a slotted all you need to do is just turn the guide uh, fully one way or the other and then the front wheels will sit quite nicely on the beam uh, without the without the uh, the guide interfering all right anybody else want to add to that or take a take another stab at the their process from car out of the box or I mean if anybody wants to talk about their process for scratch building I'm open to that too we've got a whole pretty much a whole hour to go uh, otherwise we're just going to open the floor to questions and sharing and chatting and whatnot anybody else want to talk about car setting up tuning stuff you don't want to hear me about car setup <laughs> out of the box and onto the track well with, with bracket racing it doesn't matter the, the guys that like tuning can tune. The guys that just want to drive can just do that. I, I like having all my cars quite different. Makes it more fun to do, more of a challenge to drive. Have you ever taken a car out of the box and, and said, I don't like the well, way it drives and then change it completely? If, if there's something seriously wrong, I'll fix it. But I spend most of my time building tracks. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit. I mean, what I really enjoy doing, especially scratch building, is to try and make a model race car, or at least th that is in, in, in the spirit of the actual original car. So if it's a front engine rear wheel drive car, I'll try and build a front engine rear wheel drive car. If it's a front, uh, a mid engine car or a rear engine car, actually rear engine, I got to try that, but mid engine car, especially, um, that's kind of what I try to do. And as far as tuning, um, you know, the, the wheels we, kind of we, we cast ourselves which have set screws um do our own urethane tires that we kind of you know i won't say true but at least you know they're they're, they're round uh you know they're sanded to a point but it's it's mostly just you know for for, for fun and driving around i because i really don't race with with anyone but i think that's kind of like luck i mean he spends his time doing that on the track and we kind of spend our time doing that with the cars uh, and, and again, aesthetics and um, I guess the spirit of the car is really what we're trying to, to achieve and take it around. And then, yeah, you can do different things to them to try and get them to go a, a little bit quicker. And sometimes it's just as simple as loosening some screws. That makes a, a heck of a difference. Well, then I, and and I, I think I speak for Dennis in this. Don't take us, to, like, you don't have to do any of this stuff. Um, no, you, you really don't. Um, 
and and to be perfectly honest, for most people who have like a smallish plastic set that they put together and take apart and all the rest of the stuff, you're not going to see real big gains because you're going to have if it's on the floor, you're going to have so much cat hair and the bushings and you know all the like it's it's just not going to make that. It's it's the things that are doable. Um, yeah, I guess it's sort of like, you know, you can go to Walmart and buy a camera for $10 or you can go to a high-end camera store and buy one for $40,000, you know. Um, there are big differences in the hobby, but the thing that will keep, the stuff that Dennis and I are actually talking about and doing, quite frankly, is not all that good for the hobby. Um, what the guys do when they do minor modifications and keep it simple and keep it fun is actually better for the hobby. You know, you don't need to go out and spend hundreds of dollars on tuning tools and all the rest of the stuff. Um, so building, you know, there's a couple, there's a couple of clubs in Toronto that build model cars. They're not really interested in going fast within the confines of what the cars are. And I love those clubs. The, the cars look great and you got to run skinny wheels if the car had skinny wheels and you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of opposite things in the hobby and I don't want anybody to think that, oh my God, we're doing it the wrong way. We got to go out and buy all this stuff and, and change the way we're doing things. If, if, if you like going with your buddies in the basement and having a beer and you're going around and you're laughing, keep going guys. Cause that's the most, that's the best way to do it. Sure. Well, but, but you know, Chris, I'll tell you, I, I, I don't think you guys really ruin the hobby. I think what you, what you do is show what is possible. And with just, you know, a fraction of what you guys do, you can, in, you know, learn so much and enhance what you're doing so much. So it, it's, you know, I, I mean, if I was, a bit of a musician so I, I i attribute it to going to a music store and listening to somebody playing smoke on the water on every guitar they're trying versus you know hot water by level 42 that that's kind of the difference but still the level of enjoyment is is the same i'm a level 42 guy by the way um but the other thing too is it's also kind of neat that you can get whatever you want out of this hobby like so for, so for example what i really like to do is it, 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 I, a, a Triumph TR4 should not be, you know, as fast as a modern Formula One car, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you, you try and sort of balance it that way. So take the latest Scalectrics F1 car, do your best lap on the track, and that's the high benchmark, and then take a bug-eyed Sprite uh, with, a, you know, an 030 motor, and that's the, the low benchmark, and then try and rank everything in between them. Again, it depends on what you want out of the hobby, but what you guys do show that, okay, wait a minute, my, my TR4 is like driving like a bug-eyed Sprite. How do I get it to drive like a TR4? Well, well try sanding the tires. Okay, oh gosh, look at that. So it's, it's you know, it's little things make a, make a huge difference. And you're right, you don't have to do all of the kind of tweaks, but I, I mean, just getting some ideas on how to enhance the experience, I think is, is great. Well, and, and and again, you know, Dennis, will, uh, I'm speaking for Dennis on this one, but he'll agree on this. I mean, we're, we're not by any stretch of the imagination trying to say that what you guys are doing is not right and it's not fun. Um, oh, heavens no. Um, yeah. We have a, I have a friend out here who runs some races at his home track uh, once every six weeks or so. It's all magnets. And his solution to any kind of handling problem is bung another magnet in it. And uh, it's a completely different hobby almost, right? Because so much of what I do makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, when the guys are running 300 grams of downforce uh, from, uh, you know, half of, half of Professor Moto's entire inventory of gold-colored neodymium magnets. But, but, but Dennis, that's no different than what the auto industry did during the 60s. It's like, oh, the car's heavy. Well, I'll just put a bigger motor in it. Yeah, of course. Anyway, I mean, so as Chris said, you know, every, everybody's different. I think uh, that what Chris and I do that, that is good for the hobby is stuff like we're doing today. Talk to people, uh, working, at, 
working at uh, working at um, stores, uh, interacting with all these guys. They don't have to pick up all the knowledge that we have. They don't have to try and do everything we do. You know, um, I have enough people around me who are better drivers than I am that if I prepare their cars like like I do mine, uh, they beat me easily, and I prepare my cars their cars like I prepare mine if they want it. Um, there are a couple of times where I personally just try not to win. Um, just because I know that if, if I win too much, uh, it's just going to drive people away. And they don't have the time or they don't have the motivation or they don't have the wherewithal or the knowledge uh, to do the kinds of things that I do. And uh, that's fine. Yeah, it's kind of like the equivalent of, of if you ever grew up in, with a pool table in your house. It's one of the worst things because someone will come over and play once. And if you win, that's it. You, you, got, you, you, got, you got to sandbag a little bit. Yeah. yeah I, you know, especially especially with the, when I started with the 124 scale retro racing, uh, I was in on the ground floor of that. And when I moved from California to, um, to Colorado for a while, uh, I started, I got the local raceway up there to start a program. Uh, and I was the only guy building chassis. So pretty much everybody was running one of my chassis. And I had to make very sure that I didn't win, you know. Uh, so I, I would I would fast qualify every now and then uh, just so that they knew that I was there. But, you know, uh, I often had a, a bad heat somewhere and uh, or I had a, a breakdown or uh, something because, uh, you know, you don't want to win every time, right? Especially against um, people that are spending their their hard-earned money buying the chassis that you're building for them. But but even something as wonderful as realizing that there's no limit to the slot, the car you can put on the track. So, for example, if you see a one thirty second scale model, you know you guys have really helped inspire people to say, "I'll try building a chassis out of something. It could be plastic, it could be brass." It doesn't, it doesn't, could be wood. I mean, wood works just as well as well. So, but yep. just to, to, that sort of. Make them out of popsicle for, sticks. Yeah. And not waiting for a manufacturer to produce something that you would like right now that you could hopefully do on your own. Okay. I think as far as uh, Dennis hit the nail on the head, what's, what's good for the hobby is what we're doing now. And that is making sure that people who show any interest understand that the spectrum of enjoyment is very, very large. And if they want to just pull a car out of the track, out of the box and stick it on a plastic track and run it around at full speed, and that's fine. If they want to put more magnets in and a hotter motor in, that's fine. If they want to pull the magnets out and do start working on tuning and stuff like that, that's fine too. There's all, they can go, they can go from Dennis's <laughs> more magnet guys all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is Dennis and anywhere in between. And the same goes for track building. You know, you can have the plastic track, you can have digital plastic track, you can have wood analog tracks, and you can have wood digital tracks, you can have the, your race tracks or landscape like train tracks, just everything. And they need to know that all of those things are there in the world of slot car. And that's I why think, I think, um, Greg, your, this whole Zoom call thing has been such a major uh, contribution to that. I just wish more people would get in, would get involved and get on it. You know? uh, we see some of them now and then, but uh, there are so many others out there that I'm sure would really enjoy this. There's a lot of people just watching. Billy, what did you want to say? Oh, oh no, I was just trying to say from my perspective and sort of – been back into the hobby for what 14 15 years now is that as a newbie and you come in that it was all about magnets at the start <laughs> because you weren't crashing and more driving and racing and it's fun and it's as you progress through and as you get into the forums and sort of discussions like this I'm I sit back and uh, listen and, and you realize like every hobby or everything it's a bit like I'm I'm pretty good at spreadsheets but every now and then I find someone that just you know, if you're climbing that hill, you think you're on top of it and you realise it's just a ridge line and there's another bloody ridge line and it just keeps going. And right now I'm in the foothills in slot car, but um, the journey is you suddenly realise that, okay, you start taking magnets out of the car and you're trying to balance cars and you're looking for the tips and, you know, I'll never be non-magnet because I'm on a bloody plastic bumpy track, but I like actually 
um, setting it up and getting that challenge. And I'm, I've got an analog group where we're on a wood routed track. So we do have a non-magnet and we run one non-magnet 124, which was another progression. Um, and so, and, and even first time I sanded tyres and thought, bloody hell, how good's that? And, and now I'm bor I've borrowed a mate's uh, tyre truer. So I think I know what I'm getting for Christmas because I'm going, God, that took it to another level. So all these little uh, little tools and stuff that you might say is a waste of money to borrow, I'm thinking, I want it, I want it, I want it. Because my experience has been when you, you take that little bit of advice and try that tip, you go, oh, I should have done that ages ago. Um, that said, I suppose from my experience is in I, I'm a bit klutzy, so I'm not that good at that stuff, but... I really enjoy the challenge of digital racing in terms of what goes on in your head, the strategy in the middle of racing and you're your own engineer and your, you know, your fuel um, strategy overtaking planning four or five laps ahead to reel a bloke in. Um, and, and that's one side of the hobby that just really switches me on. I, I like everything else about it, but that competitive racing um, uh, is really what gets me on that little miniature scale sort of thing. But no, I'm really enjoying this as a complete klutz newbie. I, I certainly don't get intimidated. I, I I tend to store all this stuff up knowing that, okay, I can still go 38 steps higher, but I'll just deal on these couple of low steps that I'm at and I'll just build. Um, God, if I could ever work aluminium or aluminium like you blokes, it'd be um, insane. But uh, yeah, no, appreciate it. I think probably the trickiest thing is getting the people who only know of slot cars as, you know, an AFX set or a Carrera Go set as, mm. or battery powered, you know, tchotchke, you know, fast lane set or whatever that they gave to their kid for Christmas. You know, they see that set and their, their kid, you know, plays with it or whatever. They might pull the trigger on it to play with the kid. And then, you know, the cars are crap and the, you know, the track is crap and everything just kind of falls apart and dies. And then like, yeah, slot cars suck. Well, well the, the, to your point, Greg, the look on a person's face when they first see a, a layout that's been scenic, that has scenic elements to it. The first time people see it, they go, wait a minute, I, this isn't like the track that I had as a kid that was on, on you know, the carpet that mom used to step on. Yeah. And then that's the first, and then, you know, they get a controller in their hand and it's very experiential, right? I mean, it, it's, there's no reset button when you go off the track, right? It, and, and that brings, I think, a lot of people in, but it's like anything else. It's, you got to, you got to get that first sort of trial in some way, shape or form to, and, and to show just the look of the cars. I mean, the difference between cars that were even sold by companies in the eighties versus, you know, the nineties are, are that in itself makes it you know, that much more appealing get a lot of people who, who still try to tell us that the golden age of slot car racing was in the late 60s, early 70s. They're wrong. The golden age of slot car racing is now. The variety that we have, the choices that we have, uh, as Billy was saying, he, he has a different experience to what we have. And we never had that before. I mean, when, I, when, when Chris and I and all the old guys like Luff and the, and the, and us were when we were kids, or um, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14 years old in in high school, racing slot cars back then. Uh, we didn't have anything like the kind of choices that we have now. Uh, you you almost couldn't buy anything that you didn't have to put together before you could race it. Uh, you know, maybe here in the states, but certainly where I was, uh, you didn't get them. You got all the kits, but you still had to put it together. Um, if you wanted a wood track, you had to build it yourself. There was no way that you could, uh, you know, go and find clubs with wood tracks in the early days. Um, and but even now today, I mean, you can go with this thing as far as you want to go. We've had all of these discussions about 3D printing, about resin casting, scratch building, um, you know. You can, you can be one of those guys who loves to paint bodies and just paint bodies and put little plastic chassis under them and have an absolutely wonderful time with it. You can have other people who just like to take the cars and trundle around the track and have a wonderful time. You can have guys who love to have scenerized tracks 
uh, with themes on them and they have a wonderful time. It's just, it has to be the most amazing time in a hobby. Uh, and this particular hobby is just so much more varied than almost any other hobby right now. I agree. I mean, there's no, there's no way that radio control flying or radio control ra car racing is anywhere near as varied and has as much variety as, as we have to choose from. Yeah, well, and to your point, even model trains, even when, you know, they try to model a certain era, but, you know, I, again, they, it, there's nothing like racing. I mean, you can model racing from the 1930s to the present day. As soon as my, as soon as my brother and I had two locomotives on the, on the train set we were given for Christmas, we raced model trains. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did you have any uh, uh, Gomez Adams moments or no? No, 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 no. <laughs> but you, you know what they say: that the first, the first auto race happened as soon as the second automobile was built, right? And, and like you mentioned, that's that's kind of one of the things that I like about slot cars. Because as a kid, I loved trains. I mean, I still got some Lionel stuff in the garage, and I always imagine, you know, I got the the, the model rail rotor magazines, and I would just ooh and awe ah over all the fancy landscape layouts. Uh, and then, you know, slot cars, you can race, but I never really thought that they would go together until, you know, when I came back into slot cars, you know, 12 years ago, that you could do essentially a model railroad layout, but with slot cars instead of trains and make them go fast and crash as part of the enjoyment of the hobby, not just as something that the little kids do with your fancy trains on your track when grandpa's not in the room. <laughs> And part, part, of the fun, part of the fun is taking out some of the scenery. I've done that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the last thing I posted a little while back, but oh, that was for real. That, I wiped out a plastic. Luckily, you know, no paint was chipped and everybody was fine. I, li I like modeling the Targa Florio. And I, I had people, one guy from Massachusetts, he, he built a couple of buildings and mailed them to us to add to the track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your tracks are always a, a joy to see them just spring up out of nothing. <laughs> well, they're, they're fun. <laughs> Actually, and, yeah, and, I, I, it was, maybe, maybe that's a future topic is just to, to talk about scenery and what interests people or even track tours. I'd, I'd be willing to do a, a, I mean, ours isn't anywhere near complete, but if somebody wants a tour of, of ours, I'd be very happy to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have that as a as a topic. Do you guys want to do that next week? Get your tracks ready to show off and, and show off your tracks next week? I'm in yeah, I'm in for that. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> what, what I always wanted to do was, was tell people to just uh, cut a slot, even if they just use a skill saw. Cut a slot, put on a couple of pieces of copper tape, uh, hook it up to a plastic terminal truck and, and run a car, even if it only moves two or three feet, that's the start of a wood truck. Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, tell you what, Greg, I've got to go. I've actually got a bloody real work meeting to get to at 11.30 um, um, as I'm typing away here at work. I better not say that. This will go on the web. Um, I'd really love to have a challenge. One of my greatest things I would love to be able to do is a two-lane digital wooden routed track but with the undulations and, and hills and complexity that I currently have with plastic and for the life of me I can't figure out how I can get a material that will be able to bend and get the hills and the, the, the camber shifts that I'm sort of after on a Every normal wooden routed track that I see is always too heavy. The, the, the wood's too thick. You'll never get the, the hills. And I'm actually thinking is, could you, could you do it on a very thin MDF and your slot actually cuts through the whole track and then you build it up on little... I mean... That's use, food uh, for thought. Yeah, we use 3.8 or 9 millimeter. And that, that's, you can bend the hell out of that stuff. Yeah, the 3 8 inch MDF is, is very flexible. And if it's still not flexible enough, you can kerf the bottom side. Uh, and if you look up, uh, I forget what the name of the track was, Castile something. Uh, Graham Lane was the constructor. You've probably yeah. seen 
got yeah. partially digital, partially routed. At one point, to, to get his tiny little one lane through the the Italian countryside stuff, it was it was thin, and it was the slot was all the way through, and he had to do structure holding up both both sides of where the slot was in order to get those steep hills and turns and banks and stuff like that. So there's there's a bunch you of have to, to you have to be careful, like you can go too too much, and the cars will. Uh, hang up on the center of the like if you got a long wheelbase they'll hang up on the truck yeah, but you could My, easily replicate your your current track you could easily make that in wood the tricky part with wood digital is is getting the flippers in there and making them work in the wood that's that's always the tricky part mm. i've seen a lot of guys just actually um graft in whatever systems uh, lane changes they need on a section of plastic track just to where they need them yeah, that's, that's yeah. What we do. when I go to when I go to Wood, it'll be to try and get a one twenty four. The ability to to run one twenty four as well, because um, they're just they're about as much fun as digital. Like when you they're rubbing is racing. That's that's real uh, fun. But I, but um, I, I I hear you. Like there's nothing more like off camber turns on a slot car track are are a blast. Yeah, my track's full of it, but um, there wasn't much planning in getting it. It's just, <laughs> it's just happened as I've pushed and shoved and hot glued pieces together. It's sort of like, if, if I've never done a track plan, but when it doesn't work, I'll force it into. And every six to eight months, I need to redo the tarmac, so to speak. <laughs> Whenever I see your um, track, I always feel like putting some marinara on it. <laughs> You'd, you'd be surprised. It looks like a spaghetti track, but it actually flows flat out. Like, um, no, I'd love when to. you get when you get six cars on digital and, and blokes because we're all wireless and we run around and do our own um, marshalling. And I come from an old Aussie rules footy, Australian rules footy background, so um, hip and shoulder bumping's fair contact in our slot car shed. <laughs> okay, well, it, Billy, if you ever come to Canada, I will teach you how to skate. Yes, I've got a cracked back of the head from a couple of uh, oh. ice skating rinks. That yeah, mm. <laughs> it's harder than concrete that stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, All right, yeah. I better go. It was great. Okay. I'll be I'll be back again in a fortnight. The um, <clears throat> it's now ten a.m. down here because we've got daylight saving. I tried to get in earlier, but um, no, really enjoy it. Right. Thanks for joining. Yeah. All right, so we still got a half an hour. Anybody else want to talk about what's good for the hobby? What's bad for the hobby? <laughs> Any other topic you want to bring up? Well, I, I, last, actually, last talk about, well, I mean, what, one of the things this hobby has never really done, even from its inception, was really good promotion. Yeah, once the pretty much once the fad wore off, it's just the occasional advertisement for a, a set, a toy set. Yeah, although, you know, there, there isn't a one-to-one -one racing driver I've ever talked to who didn't have uh, a slot car set. Hmm. Do you guys remember ant farms? Do you remember yeah. the little plastic ant farm? Sure. sure. Remember those? Absolutely. And sea monkey. The company, the company that started that, right? They went out of business and then quit making them. They sold the patent super cheap to some guy, paid two or 300 bucks for it. He went and started off with some friends and started going to schools, elementary schools, and showing this product and talking in the science classes and Guy wound up with a thriving business again. So when you say that it's the promotion of what we're doing, I agree with you hundred percent because there is so much more that could be done to make this hobby even bigger than it is, you know, and it is picking up speed too. I had the grandkids over this weekend and we're there. 
every hour. Can we go play slot cars now? My youngest granddaughter calls them slop cars, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, it just introducing them and teaching them how to play and not pounding them, like you said, you know, give them a chance to win, Dennis. And, um, you know, just not thrash them, but let them have fun with it. God. I turned down the voltage on mine so low, the cars would barely move, but they didn't come off, and the kids were having a blast. So, I don't know. And, and plus, as they get older, I mean, there are so many, you know, elements of the hobby that can hopefully spark some interest from anything from electronics. I mean, now we have race systems, which we never had as kids. Right. I mean, telling you anything from, a, you know, lap times, average lap times, um, setting up you know some sort of championship we never had that i mean no no we, we used to count the laps out loud right right you, you all counted your own laps when you went through one and that guy would say one you know and you'd all count your own laps that's how we did it i you think know? i think so. one. Oh, sorry. You go one four seven <laughs> that's what really used to do. It was, it was fun. I think, I think sadly, though, all you have to do is look at the pictures of the people. And my picture, even though I don't have a camera, doesn't look that much different than anyone else on here. And, you know, it's, it's just, the, the, it's a 55 plus hobby, unfortunately. I mean, that's, and when you say pr promotion is one thing, but it's also product. Um, I got my first set in 1961, and it was a VIP set my dad brought back from England. The prior year, I think I probably got like a bag of green army men that wouldn't stand up. Um, so I went from either that or an Etch-a-Sketch or soap on a rope or, a, you know, like a shower mitten or some stupid thing. I went from that to an electronic slot car set. I thought I'd gone to the, like, it was like, I was a, like a NASA scientist, right? Yep. And in the 50 or 60 years since then, not much has changed. Um, I've got a, uh, one of my best buddies has uh, an Ogilvy track in his basement. It's all seen, it's gorgeous, it's stunning. Two boys, you have to pay them to come into the basement. They're upstairs on the big screen TV playing video games. And, you know, I go up and, and go, what are you guys doing? And they're going, well, we can do this and this. And we're just setting, if they were doing a car race, oh, we can do suspension settings and do this and we can alter toe and the color. Like, and I'm going, holy Jesus, what the hell am I doing in the basement? I'm like, I'm in, uh, in a museum here with some cars. So, it's the technology really needs i mean look we all think it's great because it's the best thing since sliced bread and we grew up with green army men um and flame throwers hmm? flame throwers yeah no uh, absolutely hairspray and wd-40 right sea monkeys yes and um you know, the, a couple of the tracks that I've worked at recently um, or helped out at recently, we've really tried to have like a Sunday would be a father and son uh, day. So dad can bring his kid in and I would be there or someone else would be there to help them. As Dennis said, you know, just, just the rudimentary things and okay, here's how you make the car go better and, you know, simple, easy things. I was there for, this was the year before last, I was there I think for seven or eight weekends, we had one father and son come in in seven or eight weekends, wow. so we just folded up the program, you know. Now, admittedly, this, this particular location is a rather affluent area, so, you know, the kids are taking figure skating lessons and all other kinds of stuff and things like that, but um 
you know, you look at the members of the clubs, the average age in every single club that you guys belong to there, it's 55 and like, it's, it's not, you know, and have, you, you know, you promote it, but who's going to, you know, is Scale Electrics going to promote it? Scale Electrics and the whole, um, I buy a couple, I, I'm a shareholder in Scale Electrics, not, and when I say I'm a shareholder, I, I, I own like about four shares, only because I get an annual report. So I get to keep tabs of what their business is doing. And it's, it's, it would embarrass you how small it is. I mean, these, these companies are not big. So for them to say, uh, you know, let's put together an advertising camp. I mean, what can you, what well, can and you know, Chris, to your point, they, they have tried. I mean, I know they tried a thing with Silverstone uh, a few years back with Martin Brundle and, Absolutely. and with, you Absolutely. know, and sorry, go ahead. If, I mean, it's, 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 look at the market. I mean, when, when in the 60s, Cox, Cox cars sold more than a million of several different types of cars, like they sold, you know, a million BRM Formula One kits and, you know, a million of this and a million of that. Today's manufacturers, um, you know, if slot it does, you know, some of the smaller guys do runs of like 500 cars, a thousand cars. So, you know, I mean, Maurizio only makes money because if you do 150 liveries of the Porsche 956, you're going to sell a lot of cars, but he can't, he can't keep coming out with new body styles. It just doesn't work. Um, so it's it's the basic business foundations of the whole things that um, you, you know squander the them. I, you know, I remember SCX a few years ago um, launched a set-in target. Um, it bankrupted them in North America. Um, you know, uh, it, they, they're just weren't they weren't big enough to rebound from the thing. So it's 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 a fun hobby. It's a diverse hobby. It's cool. I've loved it my whole life, and I'll be doing it as long as I can see and do it. But I wouldn't invest a nickel in it. It's just not big enough. Yeah, I think we should be pretty happy with what we have right now, and the fact that the the that those things still exist for us to partake in them, and hopefully they last enough longer for for us to keep enjoying them. You know, and, and most of us have enough. I mean, I've got enough bits and pieces, and I know most of you do it. Dennis does. If all the slot car manufacturers in the world stop producing stuff, I can race. I'll, my grand great grandkids could race slot cars with the amount of stuff of bits and pieces that I've got. It, it, it's remarkable to me that model kits are still. I mean, I can go to Fred Meyer and and get. You know, they've got a couple of dozen model kits, you know, car model kits on the shelf. I, I they, don't have, they don't have the number and the variety that they did yeah, no, 20, no, 30 no. years ago, that's for sure. But they're still there. Although, uh, although sales, apparently, since the environment that we're in has started, sales for hobbies in general have been up like 40, 45 percent. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure yeah. which, is, which is a good thing, but... I mean, all good things come to an end. And once we can all go out and run around and play and ride our bikes and do all the rest of the stuff, we won't be building model kits. Well, I'll tell you what we do, Chris. You buy yourself another couple of shares in Scale Electric, and then we'll go find somebody in China to get to, to spread another virus, and then we'll get going from there. There you go. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> or, or we could each invest, Dennis, and open up our own company. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could. I suspect that's not going to happen. No, not really. <laughs> I'm still, I still try to keep mine a bit under the radar. Yeah. Well, I, I was, um, I was talking to Ernie today. We we're putting this bloody six lane, finishing off this bloody six lane Policar track, which is mm -hmm. the most unbelievable track system I've ever tried to put together in my life. And uh, we were sort of humming and hawing as to why, and you know. We talked to Maurizio fairly often and, and we're sort of wondering, we, we've never asked him, but we're sort of wondering why in the name of God did he come up with this idea? So who knows? And speaking of wondering uh, what you mean by that. So can you elaborate? 
Uh, based on the way the world is today, I don't see the financial viability in another plastic slot car track coming in. And, and the pond is a wonderful place. What do you think about the track? <laughs> was it a good thing that you guys were having or a bad thing? What do I think about the track? I, to be honest with you, I think I remember uh, one of our earlier periods when we had a couple of the guys on from England who um, had run on it. And I agree. I think it's a bit too easy. Uh, it's so grippy. I, I think it's it's it, it gets it's almost a little boring is my um take on the whole thing for a plastic track and if you're trying to put together anything more than a two-lane track oh it is a nightmare That's it, it, I mean, keep getting the corners together chris so or? they have all these little side clips to hold the um the, the two pieces of straights on each side of the straight, there's like three or four little recesses where you, you plug these little pins in and it locks them together. Um, they made the, they, they either made the, the pins too big or the openings too small. Um, and they're, uh, it, it is a bugger. And Maurizio knows that it, the bugger to put together. And we've got 135 feet of six lane track and it's, it's uh, there's lots of foul language going on. Is there a tool you can use to help assemble it, or, or is it all done by hand? The tool that I'd like to use will smash the track into bits, so I don't bother using it. It's tough. It, it is not, um, it is not, you know, I, I just, I'm not sure. And I haven't, and there's the other one, which is the yet to be announced. I, I, I'm not sure if it's dead in the woods, which is the scale auto plastic track. I haven't heard, I, you know, that was big rumblings on that uh, eight year, a year ago, I guess. And it's- Are those guys, are they, are they angling at, at getting in where the Ninko tracks used to be? Because I didn't know that, is Ninko even still around? Don't well, see very much. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, um, you know, there's a couple of tracks. Slotit's um, home test track is in Parma, north, Northern Italy. And that's an old polystyl track, which is in pretty ratty shape. Um, so yes, they will probably replace that with um, um, well, of car. Some, but that's one four lane track. Like, yeah. But you see all these big eight lane layouts that the guy that they build out an Ninco track for all of these big uh, events in Europe. Um, I guess at some point they're going to run out of Ninco track. So I don't know that Ninco is still making anything, are they? I think there's some Ninco around. I mean, the great thing about it, I mean, if you're going to build a great big long track, there's no plastic track in the world that's got better conductivity and joins than Ninco. I mean, that's, you get the best uh, conductivity with Ninco track head and shoulders above anything else there without, without taps and all the rest of the stuff. Yeah. That's that's one thing that I know Mauricio was targeting with the Policar track. I'm, I'll be interested to find out how how that uh, works out with your guys' six laner. It's well, we were up there today, and and actually, I was I, I took a bunch of um, non typical thirty second scale uh, motored cars that draw some amperage to 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 do some initial tests on the track, and we've got. It's 135 feet, and Ernie only put in uh, eight taps, and I think we need to put in more. So the um, the rails on the Policar track don't have quite the iron content that the Ninko, that the actual physical um, male female joins are are good and secure. Are you leaving? No, I'm just waving at Russell's wife. <laughs> Okay, um, um, but the lack of the, the, the less iron content is not, it sort of detracts a little bit from the, the conductivity around it. We'll get it sorted out. We'll put a lot of taps and we're just gonna throw, 
you know, 50 or 60 amps at it to push the voltage around the track and it'll be, it'll be fine, but it's a lot of work. Hey, Chris, Chris is, is it a plot? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, let me ask you a question. As far as your, your opinion, what do you think is the best plastic track? Uh, well, I mean, the, it's. Well, the, when I, I mean the best made, put it that way. Well, it's hard to beat Carrera plastic track. It really is. Um, you know, for a bunch of reasons, least of which is it's styrene based. So if you want it to act like a wood track, you can paint it and the paint sticks on the styrene very, very well. Now you've got a, a wood track surface for lack of a better description. You're running on latex paint. Um, it, it's got a, a, a plastic slot with the rails on either side. Um, it's very, it, and it's a little wider, so, you know, you can run some 24 scale cars on it and, and stuff like that, and things like that. Um, it is a track, because it's styrene, it's brittle, so it is happier to be set up and staying set up. It's not, if you remember when you were a kid and you had an HO track, which is basically made out of the same stuff, I was forever breaking the bloody tabs on the things and buying new bits of track, which is which is sort of like a career. Unlike, you know, scale electric sport track, your dog can chew that stuff and nothing happens to it, right? So, so for a certain clientele, it's it's the greatest track in the world. Um, I know when I was um, at the shop selling tracks, the first question is, how old are your kids? Well, my kids are gonna they're gonna run on it chasing the dog and the dog's gonna chew it and it's so fine scale electric sport go second question how much room do you have not much room scale electric sport go um i want to build a great big table room's no issue space is no issue and it's going to be permanent pick a carrera track um so I mean, what's best, it depends on your application of what, what Greg has on his table right there. He couldn't build anything like that with Carrera track because of the physical uh, radius and the dimensions of the track. It's it's big track. You need big room to, to build one. So um, that didn't answer your question at all, but that's, that's my that's, that's my and SCX is is perfect. SCX and um, is really not that much different at all than um, than uh, scale electric track. So it's it's how you set them up and how you power them and how you look after them and how you clean them. And it's all... Chris, it sounds a lot like cars. No, well, yeah, no, no, absolutely. They're all different applications, different things. Yeah. You know. Um, Chris. Chris gave the perfect consultant's reply to that. The first two words, it depends. Well, I mean, I, hate this. I can't spend a lot of my time with that, yeah, as a consultant. And somebody said, Same What's here. The and, that's, and I'll tell you, as a consultant, I warn them. <laughs> you warn them, it depends. No. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's, that's a great note to end on. And, and I'll just kind of reiterate I agree with everything that Chris and Dennis have just said about the track. Um, I'll add that I think Ninko is kind of in the middle. It's got the softness of the Skelectric Sport and SCX tracks, but it has the the line slot uh, to help protect from sh you know shorts from screws in the in there. But that liner can sometimes cause its own problems. Every track has pros and cons. Every track has the has an a, an application that it's ideal for, and every person has a need that uh, that not all tracks will fill right so like chris was saying the first question is i mean honestly the first question is why do you ask <laughs> you know and then it's like well what's the situation you know who's going to be using it where's it going to be all that kind of stuff and i just recommended on facebook to 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 a guy who was wanting to bust out his eldon cars but he also has ho and he also wants to try 124 and he has lots of room and i said get career track you can plop an ho car on career track you can pop a 124th car on Carrera track, but you're not going to fit a Carrera track in the space, like Chris was saying, that I that I got this track in. And on that note, we are at our five minutes to four hour mark. Does anybody else want to toss in anything on the track question? 
One, one final one, Chris, uh, the polish steel, what, what is, what is it? Is it, is it uh, styrene? Yep. It is. It's, it's a styrene base and um, it has a, a series of uh, quite aggressive striations in a, in a grid pattern on the track. So it Almost is- Almost looks like it's 3D printed. Yeah, it's, it, well, it does. It's, 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 uh, so it's quite abrasive to the touch. So, you know, again, which is great for, um, you know, race clubs where the guys generally put, you know, a new set of tires on every race or two. Um, I don't, I haven't had enough experience running around and around and around and around on it to, to give you a good idea on how quickly it's going to chew up um, rubber or urethane tires, um, but I expect fairly quickly. Now, would you, being styrene based, would you recommend that uh, that track be painted or not? Uh, not really, because on this track, it's not the paint. It, it's not on a Carrera track. Yes, because it's a smoothish track surface, so you end up running on a latex surface like wood. Um, I think the striations on the um, uh, Policar track are pronounced enough that you'd have to put 63 coats of latex on it to, to get rid of the stri to get rid of the striations. So um, it is. It's That's a, a bit like my 3D printed bodies. Well, <laughs> I, got, I got a couple of those today from uh, uh, Shappy Man. Um, one of them, uh, it was, I, he had, he, he's had a file for a McKee Mark 10 Can-Am car, which is a really cool looking car and really unique. So he sent me one today and I'm glad he's not on, but it, <laughs> it weighs 42 grams. And I can't see I have enough time in the next year and a half to sand this thing acceptably smooth. Yeah, and one of the, like one of the guys previously was mentioning, or, or I brought up, you can always try getting some of the UV cured resin, just kind of paint on the resin, but then you're it's going to be a heavy body, obviously. <laughs> I was curious, actually, John, you were you were you actually said Paula Steel track? Did you oh. mean car or the? Because Paula, oh. I've never Paula Steel, of course, is no longer in production. It's old track. Sorry, but I also wanted to kind of toss in there that there's there's lots of there's lots of old track that we can't even, we don't have enough time to talk about right now. Well, gosh, like, yeah, well, Monogram, Revell, I mean, the it's list goes on. Rubber track. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. kinds of crazy stuff from the past. Yeah. Maybe, we'll help. Maybe we'll talk about that next time. But for now, I'm going to actually go ahead and hit the stop button. Uh, well, so. Revell is my favorite track of all time. Revell is Chris's favorite track of all time. Bye. Mm -hmm.